Why don't we start with laying the foundation? Because our listeners might not know anything about you or Toltec wisdom. What is Toltec? Like, tell us about your lineage and your experience growing up with your family. Well, first of all, Toltec, it is a tradition from a long time ago that my family came from. And it means in Nahuatl, artists of the spirit. And, uh, and we're created to see everything as art, everything that we do in life as an art. So we can go back in time for the first Mexican in my family that uh, we can count. It's my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather that was living in uh, New Spain. And when the Mexico got independence, it became Mexico. So from that, he had a son called Don Leonardo. And then he had a daughter called Madre Sarita. And then Madre Sarita, my grandmother, had my father, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, which is the author of the Four Agreements. And then he birthed uh, me and my brothers. And uh, Michael and me are the ones who do uh, write, continue writing books and things. So you're saying this wisdom was passed down all the way from like, like that long ago. And then tell yes. us, okay, so, so what kind of beliefs did you learn early on? How did it shape your life? Because I think this... The wisdom that you share is so deep. Like, did you always grow up with this wisdom? It was just common sense from the beginning of, of my family. So it was a way of celebrating life. It was just a, a way of living the way that knowing that everything's a dream and whatever you want in your life, you can manifest. But of course, you know, being a teenager in the in the 80s and 90s, um, well, the pure pressure of life began happening. So one gets seduced by wanting to fit in with the friends and the neighborhood and, you know, and then wanting to be something that little by little, the core teachings are inside of us, but yet again, we get lost with life. And then later in time, um, when we decide to go back to the training, is when we ask ourselves the question, is there more than life than this? And every generation that asks these questions to, you know, the elders, uh, they put a smile because that's a symbol that the training is about to begin. Oh. So did your family expect you to become a spiritual person and also to teach or or did they kind of let you do your thing <laughs> well they always let us do our thing but deep inside in my heart i always knew i i was going to do this work because i always feel appealed i mean i, I was always feeling like, like towards this this dream and i remember being like nine or ten years old when i was visiting my grandmother so when my, my grandmother was a faith healer so she did consultations all day. My mother used to assist her by translating. So I, on the weekends, I get along the ride. And then one day, um, my grandmother had me put my hands on one of her clients, one of her patients. And she said, just close your eyes. Don't think about anything. But just feel the transmission between your body and their body and send them that vibration that you would like to send. Well, anyways, when that was over... She asked me, what do you want to do with your life? And of course, I said, I want to be a healer like you and a messenger mm -hmm. like my father. And he, she put a smile and says, and what would you like to do this? Because we were in America, in San Diego at the time. And I said, I want to do it in Japan. And she got me off guard. Why Japan? It's because I will have a translator with me. And I have no idea to police the translator. I'm just going to open for my heart and speak. Well, 20 years later, that actually happened. I was in Japan and I transmitted this but before i got to transmit that in japan 20 years later i had to go and unlearn many things how i used to hurt jose how i picked those along the way as a teenager and a young adult to get to that position so everything in life uh, happens for a purpose but when we decided that we're going to do this journey it's because our elders say okay they're going to enter the jungle they may get lost in the jungle but if they return they're going to be able to share what we share and keep the family tradition alive that's so beautiful. I know you have quite a story. I mean, tell us about your experience in your early 20s. Did you lost your eyesight? And what happened? And how did you navigate through that challenge? Well, uh, the thing that happened is in my in my youth, I, I became addicted to substance, to drugs and, and stuff like that. Um, and then when I got liberated from that and I began walking the path, I did a little damage in my eyes, but I didn't realize it. And when I got a, a root canal, Two years later, after I became sober, the nerve system got affected by the medicine that got triggered behind my eye and in front of my brain. So in that moment, it created like a inflammation and uh, it made damage to my eye that I lost my eyesight for almost two weeks. Mm. Anyways, those two weeks was when I realized that I couldn't see before. I only wanted to see what I wanted to see. 
And because of the life that I did before, and when I saw my mother crying, it gave me strength to say, mom, I'm okay. And it really, that gave me some strength to not feel sorry for myself, not to be victim after feeling frustration, of course, and desperation. Then I just surrendered to it. But there was something magical that happened is that in my dreams, I could see. So I had a course in, in, in a lucid dreaming. But when I woke up like two weeks later from a profound dream and I could see blurry, I walked up to the bathroom and I saw myself in the mirror and I saw my physical body like if it was a different, complete person. And I said, you know, this person that I see in the mirror every day, I'm seeing it once again. And it's always loyal to me. And that's when I asked myself this question, when I'm going to be starting being loyal to this person in front of me? And that's when I really understood the Totec tradition. And in Totec tradition, there's nothing to learn but unlearn what takes our inspiration away to live life. So from that point on, I begin, you know, working on myself to let go of the addiction of suffering that I carry without knowing it. Because, you know, a young mind just picks up everything that it sees and tries to survive until they ask the question, is there more than life than this? And when we hit that point, especially when I hit that point after losing my eyesight, I said, you know, I really want to enjoy this dream. But before I do it, I have to unlearn and be honest in my own path. Yeah. Since you're already talking about these these concepts, addiction to suffering and the Toltec wisdom, why don't you start from the beginning? How do you explain like the most important lesson in Toltec wisdom? Well, the first important lesson in the Toltec tradition is life and death. If you don't understand these concepts, any story, any illusion, any drama, any heartbreak will get you away from the truth. The moment that you know life and death, you know that everything begins and everything ends. And we're here to experience the most that we can consciously. So with this awareness, it's not about religion. It's not about searching. It's about surrendering that we have the the, the strength to overcome anything in life and to deliver it to ourselves because no one is going to do so because no one knows what we think. Like, I know what makes me happy and I know what makes me suffer. And how do I know this? Because I am me. I can be honest with myself without creating lies and just tell myself the honest truth. And this is what many people are afraid to tell themselves, the honest truth, to know what's stopping them. Because, you know, in the addiction of suffering, we're programmed to live in a pain that we're used to, just get settled in a life that we don't make us have inspiration But when we know that there's life and death, there's no time to waste. That's why many people who had that experience, they become enlightened and awakened because slap them on a big slap in the Mm -hmm. face and they say, you're still alive. So they have the opportunity to enjoy each day of their life, no matter what's happening in the outside. Can you explain more about how everybody's living in a dream? I think that's a concept some people don't understand at first. So how do you explain it? Yes, because there's so much investment in reality. In the real search, you know, I work eight years or 10 years in this company. So, you know, this company owes me things. You know, when we realize that nothing belongs to us, we don't owe anything. We can have things in the bank account, but when we go home, when we love the body, it's still going to be there. We don't take nothing with us. So what we begin seeing is the dream of the planet. And it's not the planet Earth dreaming. It's what the humanity has made of the planet Earth. And the humanity dreams from, let's say, 5,000 years ago that it created a language. And here's the thing. People believe that the language is truth instead of using it like a tool, like a vehicle to communicate to one another. They made the language the truth that in the Totec tradition, the language is the biggest illusion. Why? Because in the language creates stories. And then with stories, you know, people can invent stories and manipulate by the word of suggestion that people stop thinking for themselves and they get rushed by the sea. And when I mean the sea, it's a dream of the planet's illusion that it takes them away from the reality. Let's say if somebody was told from a a young age that they cannot sing, that they sing horribly, they will believe that story and they will make the character of their life into the person who cannot sing beautifully Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. there is an inner judge. So this happens in all the world. The corruption of knowledge is the corruption of the word. That's why the first agreement of the four agreements is very powerful to be impeccable with your word because your word is the one that creates the story. But when you are aware that words create a story, then we enter the dream of the magician because words are magic. You can create divine magic or negative magic, like break someone's heart, make ill intent to people because, you know, 
the suggestion of the word is so powerful and the power of the belief as well. But when we begin freeing ourselves from words and people begin judging us, you know, we know it's not truth. So that gives us advantage for an immune system for the sickness that is in the world. But first thing that we need to do is to respect our mind, our thinking mind, our temple, knowing that words come and go. They will try to hook you. And this is when I realized that I have a mission in my life is to protect myself from myself. Every day in life, every interaction that I have, and I do it in my own way. Because if I try to do it in someone else's way, I'm going to fail because I'm trying to prove to them. And when I know there's nothing to prove, but to let go of suffering, that's the ultimate thing. And many people, they dream a life, not knowing they're living a life that of suffering and they get used to and make everything complicated and making everything complicated, we can see the easy escape. The door is right there to get out. But we make it complicated to get out the door because we have to do it a certain way to please. And this is where humanity fails. We're pleasers. <laughs>